Or hi everybody. I thought I would surprise you. Usually I come live on Wednesday, but today, uh, you know, I had a, some time to myself. I was reading this wonderful book. Uh, some of you may know I'm a new student of interpersonal neurobiology. And it's just my time to read on Saturday for self-care. And I just, I was so like overwhelmed with it and so happy with it that I wanted to come in and share with you. So let me just make sure everything is okay. It looks like I am live. I hope you're enjoying your Saturday. Hi everyone. So today I want to cover categories of attachment in the interpersonal neurobiology framework. So what is interpersonal neurobiology? Uh, it's a interdisciplinary uh, field study that uh, really understands and studies the mind, right? And its relation to the body and its relation to the social network. Um, and another word for that is actually neuro, uh, relational neuroscience. So another word for that is relational neuroscience. And it's because um, it's understanding the brain and the mind in relation to the social network, to the body, and the overall um, idea, the overall idea of IPNB, interpersonal neurobiology, um, so in short, IPNB, is integration. How do we integrate body, mind, and social network into well-being for the individual? So, it was founded by Dr. Dan Siegel, whom you know I love. And basically, um, in this um, chapter 21, uh, of the pocket guides to interpersonal neurobiology. I don't know if you can see that and I can link the, the book for you. So categories of attachment. So the first idea is to understand that attachment can be secure or insecure. So secure attachment is when you have a feeling of certainty that the person relating to is going to meet your needs or be positive in your life or help you coach you. So you have that positive feeling, feeling of knowing and certainty that everything is going to be all right. In a parent-child relationship, secure attachment is the best, is the best predictor of executive functioning, of emotional regulation, of social emotional intelligence. So definitely we should strive to ensure we have a positive, secure attachment with our child. Uh, then you have insecure attachments. And for that, Dr. Dan Siegel used, used um, a field of study uh, created, actually initiated by psychologist Mary Ainsworth. Basically, she created an assessment um, to called the strange, the strange situation classification. Um, and basically, with infants, understanding with infants from six months to eighteen months, how we can categorize their attachments to their caregiver. And basically, um, uh, the, so the, the the experiment is. You have a, a, an infant in the room with the caregiver. The caregiver steps away for a few minutes, then comes back, and we start um, understanding, um, assessing, and observing the infant's behavior, right? Um, and linking that with the form of attachment um, observation as well with the caregiver. So three forms of insecure attachments were identified by Dr. Dan Siegel uh, in the IPNB framework, and I wanna go over those with you. The first one is the ambivalent or resistant attachment. In the ambivalent or resistant attachment, the child doesn't have this knowing that the caregiver is going to be meeting his or her needs, or has some kind of a knowing, but it's really unreliable inconsistent, ambivalent. And so the attachment becomes ambivalent or resistant. Uh, in the strange infant uh, experiment, the infant is clearly showing um, an ambivalence between trying to get close to the caregiver coming back into the room and at the same time moving away from the caregiver. And so that is part of being in a ambivalent or resistant attachment. Number two is 
avoidant attachment. So if the situation in the past has been difficult for the child with the caregiver, um, and for any reason, the child is actually has a feeling that um, this, the needs, their needs will not be met, will not be met by the caregiver, then this triggers a situation of avoidance, avoidant attachment. Um, and so in the, the strange infant situation, you can clearly see that the child is withdrawing. The child is disconnecting and shutting off the need for other. Uh, the child is definitely avoiding the caregiver. Um, and then the third one is really the one with the most detrimental um, impact on a child's social emotional development. The third one is called disorganized or disoriented attachment. Disoriented I like better because it explains more what it means. Uh, basically, the child is living a terrible paradox, a terrible dilemma, a terrible situation where the caregiver is supposed to give them emotional and physical security is actually causing a threat on their emotional and physical well-being. It could be neglect, it could be um, abuse, whether physical or emotional. Um, and the child is then living what Dr. Dan Siegel calls a biological paradox. The biological paradox is uh, the sim uh, simultaneously experiencing two tensions going different opposite ways. The brain stem is the 300 million year old brain. It's biologically wired to escape, to escape danger. At the same time, you have the less primitive 200 million year old brain biologically wired to move towards the group for protection. And so this situation cannot have a, a resolution, right? Because the, the child's basically uh, torn into two different opposite directions and there's no resolution. So the only solution is to leave in fear, leaving in fear. Uh, and so this disoriented attachment definitely has the worst outcomes for the social and emotional well-being of the child. Um, and this is when I want to talk about trauma. And I know it's a big word, and I know we link trauma to PTSD, life-threatening situations. But bear with me, because if you only view trauma in this definition, then you miss uh, the situations in our everyday life where we are experiencing trauma. Trauma is not only a life-threatening stress. It could be built in every single day of our lives, and you know our life is very stressful. Um, so trauma is the nervous system, complete inability to cope. It's feeling completely overwhelmed. It's feeling completely like at a loss, consistently, at various levels of intensity. Trauma is complete dysregulation of the nervous system. And um, we become disoriented and we cannot cope. So yes, uh, trauma can be PTSD and life-threatening situation, but it can also be the built-up stress of our everyday lives. And the, the minute we see that, the minute we ask ourselves what we could do to ease our nervous system, specifically in those difficult times, is the minute we can actually you know, have an impact on what's happening. So um, with the idea of trauma, I want to talk about something else that it's called the adult um, attachment interview. And it's the most reliable, most trusted, research-backed, empirical data-based um, uh, way assessment these days that we can have to understand if an adult has any trauma if an adult has any unresolved trauma. So this AAI, Adult Attachment Interview, is a list, is a questionnaire, uh, very targeted questions to understand if you have trauma and if you have um, basically unresolved trauma. Unresolved, right? Um, and, the, and the reason it, why it's so important, actually, it's because um, there's been a very... Uh, clear correlation between disoriented the, the category of attachment in the infant 
and the type of um, AAI results you get as a, um, as an adult, um, and very clear correlation between the infant's category of attachment and the caregiver AAI assessment. Um, and so one example is if the child is experiencing disoriented attachment, then um, simultaneously it's been, it's been found that the caregiver has unresolved trauma. So what happens with the unresolved trauma? There's emotional dysregulation happening. Maybe the executive functioning is lagging and the adult is starting to pose a threat either to the emotional or the physical well-being of the child. The child then forms the disoriented attachment through the biological paradox we talked about. And then having the impact that we talked about throughout his or her life. And then when th this child becomes an adult, right, and, and, and has children, they will pass the unresolved trauma onto their children. And the story goes on and on and on. You see how this can be self-fulfilling, right? Um, and by the way, I want to also mention that as a, as a, as a side idea, by the way, AAI, um, unresolved trauma, has also been linked to difficulty in romantic relationships um, for the adult growing up. Um, so you could see how disoriented attachment can have can take its toll on relationships, right? That's, thus setting this adult up for repetitive lifelong disappointments in, in his or her um, romantic relationship. So attachment has a lot of impact, is, is, is something that's been seen and found and researched and established. So uh, with all those correlations in mind, what I want to ask you is, I think those are the questions we should ask ourselves. What are we doing today to ensure we build a secure attachment with our kiddo? What are we doing today? to ensure that we are building secure attachments with our child. And if we find that, um, you know, maybe our child is experiencing resistance, avoidant or disoriented attachment, what are we doing to remedy? What are we doing to remedy? Because the good news with neurosciences, and that's, I, I think why I love it so much, it's because the brain is evolving every single day of our lives until the day we die. So there's always hope. We can always rewire our brain we can always um recreate those neural firing this attachment this secure attachment we can always build that today is the first day of the rest of our lives so what are we doing what are we doing to ensure secure attachment every single day of our lives and how are we prioritizing secure attachment with our child over grades over behavior over everything knowing the impact it will have in, in our child's life. The second question is, what are we doing today, today, to make sense of our past trauma, to make sense of our unresolved negative patterns? What are we doing today to make sense of our unresolved trauma and negative patterns? Because parents who can resolve their unresolved trauma can remove this transfer, this transfer of disorganized attachments onto the next generation. The best gift we can give our child is to make sense of our unresolved problems. The best gift we can give our child is to make sense of our unresolved patterns. So that what we felt, the fear, the overwhelm, the feeling of insecurity, the anger, the anxiety, whatever we felt was overwhelming. We couldn't cope. We couldn't, it was overwhelming in our life. Whatever we felt, they don't need to feel. We're not passing on to the next generation. It stops with us. Yep. And we do that through secure attachment. 100% through secure attachment, yeah, secure attachment.